from Screen Junkie Studios in the heart of Los Angeles, this is Screen Junkies Movie Fight. Now your host, Andy Signor. Greetings, Screen Junkies. Welcome to an amazing episode. This one has been asked for for so many, for so long. Uh, our friends over at Collider have so many talented people over there, and we thought, what better way to bring them on this show than to make them all come and to all fight? And they're here today. Look over at that couch. Yay! Oh man, we got Christian, we got Judge Schnepp, we got Dennison, Ken Knapsack, Perry Namaroff, Mark Riley, Wendy Lee, Josh McCuga. Thank you all for coming, guys. Thank you. So, yes, a few of you guys have been meaning on the show for the longest time, and we'll get you back officially, but you're here now for the first time. Some of you are, have done this show before, uh, but this is going to be a different format. If you're not familiar with our last fighter standing format, the way this is going to work today is I will be drawing the names out of the hat. This is completely at random. It's not a, a Twitter poll. We thought that wasn't fair. This is completely random. I'm going to pick three of you to come up here and fight for the first round. But to change today's episode and make it a little bit more exciting, the, the first player I pick in this first round will also get to pick which question we do. Now, these people know the six round possibilities, but now there's actually an advantage you guys can play because the first person I pick will get to pick the question, and then the winner of every round after that will get to choose what the next round's question is and will be able to answer first, which is a huge advantage. So, you guys, everybody understand how we're playing this? Does this make sense? Yes, sir. Yeah. You're at a little bit of a disadvantage if you have to go first, because that means you're going to have to stand here through the whole fight to make it. But it can happen. Dan Merle, who's on the couch, he made it to the very end on our first last fighter standing, but then you lost to Alicia, I right? I did. But I, I redeemed myself because she cashed in, and I was able to, to win the day. But yes, it's not fun. and it's, It is fun, but it's not easy. Uh, it's any not tip, easy. Do you have any tips for the players? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, you know, if you're up there for a while, just remember, as long as you're in the top two at the beginning, you stay. But with the added advantage, that adds a new wrinkle. But, yeah, it's uh, usually you're trying to win every point. But sometimes I don't want to give you strategy tips, but sometimes if there's one player that shows a weakness, it's in two players' interests to uh, stay in the game. So Team up and destroy. you, you got to play it strategically. <laughs> well, I'm excited for it. Shall we do this? Yeah, let's do it. This is going to be intense. All right, first player up. I'm not looking. I'm just sh shuffling. Here we go. First player is, and you will choose the round. That's only advantage. Since you got picked first, you'll choose the question. Perry Nemiroff. Oh, Perry. Oh, oh Perry. I'm so sorry. But hey, you at least get the advantage of this. You will choose the first question. She's got bangs, Perry. <laughs> So Perry, welcome to the show. Come on up here. Next up, taking on Perry, will be... Oh, I can't. JT, this is going to be fun. The graphic challenge. I'm, I'm excited. I made JT do a lot of complicated graphics today oh, with no. a random order. Next up, Josh McCuga. <laughs> Josh, and our first round will be our last one for the first round. Mark Riley. Oh, hey. Wow, you three should uh, wait, play the lottery. No, you shouldn't. Is that, yeah, this yeah, should be odds of getting picked, well, it's all the same for me. Oh, all right, so the rest go. of people on the couch will potentially advance to round two, so whew, consider that a break. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Uh, up, so let's, uh, let's do this. Happening? First up, Perry Nemeroff, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you me. I'm excited to finally get to do movie fights. This is going to be so much fun. Uh, hopefully you get some horror stuff, right? Uh, that would be nice. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, next up, Josh McCuga. What's up, Andy? You've, Great to you've be You've crushed here. TV fights. Been here a couple times in TV yeah. fights. A lot of fun. I'm, I'm excited for this because a lot of people don't know I actually watch movies as well. Yeah. We'll find out yeah. if that's true. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Lastly, Mark Riley, so happy to have you back. You played this game a couple times. I have. Good to be back, Andy. So you have a little bit of an advantage here. I, I, no, not with these guys. <laughs> these guys are great. Great. I mean, we're, we do this for a living. Let's do this. I'm having fun. All right. We're going to do it. First round. Well, Perry, what is the round you're going to... What question would you like... Do we have the uh, graphic of our oh, questions? Oh, yeah. Come on, Perry. I know what go, I'm Perry. going Here for. we go. Which question would you like to tackle first? I want question number three. Pitch oh. Adam Sandler's oh. next terrible Netflix movie. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. I love it. All right. I have to, this is really complicated because I adjust my schedule to see. Here we go. Netflix. Andy, question for you before yes. we start. Is this Andy... Is this... Andy Andy Samberg. Is this Adam Sandler? Is this, do you want the movie to sound horrible or do you want it to be good? 
Uh, or is it, it, it needs to be the most Adam Sandler. Okay, got it, got it. Got is, it. That, is that yes. clear? Sure. sure. The most Adam Sandler. Shut up! All right. <laughs> All right, now before we do round one, I do need to say a word from today's sponsor. Adam Sandler. <laughs> you good? This episode, I'm so happy, is brought to you by Screen Junkies Mugs. That's right. Hi. Have you ever struggled with drinking out of a tap or from a gallon of milk and wish there was a smaller receptacle you could pour your drink into for easier consumption? Well, that's right. The Screen Junkies mug solves that problem. You can drink hot drinks, cold drinks, bubbly drinks, or even Mike's Hard Lemonade. You can get your handle on your beverage with the Screen Junkies mug. Get it today for the low cost of $10. Move quickly because inventory is limited. Go to ScreenJunkies.com slash merch or the click in the description below. Screen Junkies mugs. Look how much fun they're having. I, I think we can agree, drink like a screen junkie, but don't drink like Ken Napsok. That's just... I'm going to drink like Ken Napsok. That guy could, is fun. You could sip like Ken Napsok. Well, there you go. Screen junkies. Mug. This is, that is a for real commercial. Uh, act fast, because we don't have that many in there, but we'll order more if you guys really want I'll tell you what, Andy. So I've been having trouble drinking mugs. the last couple of years, I, honestly. How good does this feel? Unbelievable. The ergonomic, ergonomic handle with the easy pour it has this. Spouse. It looks like it's dirty, but that's actually a style. It's called like before spec, this, something it's a cheap 101 number. Dalmatian style. Yes, yeah, 101 Dalmatian style. Before this, he's like Ken Stryker in airplane. He yeah. had a drinking problem. Yeah. Right All right, in the here face. we go. Round one. Come on, Perry. Oh, oh I have first. to go first. I want to fight you. you want to fight? Let him fight. Fine. Stop this fight! I'll kill you. I could do this all day. All right, I round like one. Here we go, Perry. You get to start us off, and you get to pitch. All right. The best Adam Sandler Netflix film for his new four-picture deal that they just signed. Mm -hmm. I'm pitching Adam Sandler's next terrible Netflix movie, and I'm pretty sure I have the perfect combination. I want an Adam Sandler character team-up movie, Avenger style. I want to kick off the Adam Sandler cinematic slash Netflix universe wow. and have like Jack and Jill, Billy Madison, Bobby Boucher, all the most annoying characters you could possibly think of team up, and I'm going to make it a little more terrible by making it a live action animated movie. So all the Adam Sandler characters come together and they gotta fight an animated alien invasion where the aliens only talk minion style. <laughs> if it doesn't get much much more terrible than that, I'm pretty sure I just locked this. So confused. wait, just so I'm clear, all of the Sandler characters are coming back in live action form oh, fighting yes. cartoon aliens and, that sound like minions. And Adam Sandler is gonna play every single one, so it's gonna be the movie starring Adam Sandler. And Adam Sandler, and Adam Sandler, and Adam Sandler. I think that's that's an instant win. In Will any other Netflix Sandler categories. character friends be in this? Character friends, like his his, his actor friends. His actor friends. Oh my, yes. You can. I mean, you could put them all in there. Now I gotta think. <sighs> Okay, well, you can keep telling yeah. us if that's going to happen. But all right, I got enough for your first pitch. We'll come back for more. Here. Josh, you're up next. Okay, everybody is really looking for that that Adam Sandler reboot that we've all been dreaming of. And I'm going to do Happy Gilmore, the Senior Tour. Now, here's what happened. After his legendary performance at the Tour Championship when he took down Shooter McGavern, his career has gone to the skids. He hasn't won a major since. His uh, career with Subway went through. He's tried to, he, not only did he come back and try to play hockey again, but he jump kicked a man on the ice. Instead of stabbing him, he was the first player to actually try and jump kick somebody. Uh, he's now back trying to make it on the senior tour, except he's had major back surgery and thus can't run up to the ball and has to swing the club normally. All the normal characters are back, like Shooter McGavin now yeah. on the senior tour. Yeah. You've got his caddy, David Spade, Kevin Nealon. David Spade wasn't in the original Happy Gilmore, but we're throwing him in there because he seems to be in all of them. A Rob Schneider, perhaps a Kevin James as, as a Kevin Stadler coming in in there, maybe a Duffy Waldorf. Uh, and obviously you're going to get a Lee Trevino, you're probably going to get a Tiger Woods, because he's not doing anything. You know what you need in an Adam Sandler movie? As many cameos as humanly possible. And how do you do that? You make Happy Gilmore the senior tour, 75 cameos per act, making it the greatest <laughs> Adam Sandler cameo movie ever. Happy 75 Gilmore. 75 per act? Okay. Per act, yeah. That's All right, Mark, try and follow that. <laughs> well, I can, Andy, because I'm going to tell you something. With Adam Sandler's career being the way it is, it reminds me of a lot of franchises that come to the end of the stop and they need a fresh start. And what do they do? They send them to space. <laughs> Adam Sandler in space. 
with a little twist. Because as we saw with Ridiculous Six, he was doing a, a little riff on the Quentin Tarantino uh, movie. Uh, so we have Adam Sandler kind of riffing on Moon, Oblivion, Adam Sandler, clone. We have a bunch of clones. However, they're in a space station. Nobody knows who is the original. So you have a bunch of clones running around not knowing what's going on. Who's the clone? Who's the real guy? Are you? I don't know. I don't know. So they're trying to figure it out. All the while, their space station, it's crippled. It's going into orbit, and it's going to crash into Earth. And these dipshit clones are trying to figure out how to save the Earth. And hilarity ensues. Is Sandler playing the clones? Of course he is. All of them? All of them. Okay. Yeah. All right, so we have two movies here with multiple Sandlers yeah. and one just going back to the well. All right, fight it out, guys. Why is yours? I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. All three of them are terrible. <laughs> I don't know if that one's so terrible. As a big Happy Gilmore fan, Happy well, Gilmore you're just complimenting on, me on, my, on the uh, scene. No, I am complimenting Here's you. the thing. I think with both of your movies, what you're getting at here is that Adam Sandler is really trying to take over his Eddie Murphy roots, right? He wants to play. He wants to go back to that Jack and Jill, the classic, that the Oscar-nominated Jack and Jill. Mm. I know Christian Harloff's favorite Adam Sandler movie. What, what you're missing here is uh, that Adam Sandler can play so, he is so versatile in his roles. When it sure. comes to it, he's got Southern guy. He's got <laughs> Southern guy. And uh, of course, everybody's favorite, yelling Southern guy. So what, you, you, what, you, what you're missing with just cloning him and having him fight space aliens is a character study. You could go back to a toll booth Willie. Could you put him in there? Could you put, you know, uh, the goat? You, could you put him in those movies? And the way you're panning it out, I don't think you can do that. But you're going off the argument that th this is the terrible mm -hmm. Adam Sandler. You're pulling in characters that are beloved by the fans. Happy Gilmore, even Perry. I love your Avengers team up. But you're bringing back some favorites. Billy Madison. We're talking the Adam Sandler awful Netflix. He's not, he's not going back and doing Happy Gilmore. We're talking clones doing this thing since, like Jack and Jill, like these movies where he's running around like a bumbling idiot, I would love to, see, I would actually turn on an Adam Sandler movie that ha that was a sequel to Happy Gilmore because that's one of my favorite Adam Sandler movies. I would look make... at the Avengers and go, oh my God, Billy Madison is back? I'm going to check that out. This is a movie clone Adam Sandler. I would not turn it on. You're that's a horrible, horrible Netflix Adam Sandler movie. Adam Sandler cinematic universe even worse? Sure. Because that's a great idea, adding more characters from his other movies. And if it's a cinematic little universe, Nikki? you could pull anybody. Well, Lil, Lil Nicky's already an Avenger in this idea. Uh, I want... Peter Dinklage from okay. from the Pixel, Pixel movie. Uh -huh. I want Taylor Lautner from Grown Ups because who's a bigger scene stealer in Grown Ups than Taylor Lautner? Sure. Andy Samberg and that's Juanita, my boy. Juanita, Juanita from Billy Madison. She's amazing. Snack packs? Yep. You got to have the snack packs. And then you add Kevin James, but he plays at the same time the same role he's played in all of his different Adam Sandler but here's movies. The you guys are missing out on what makes a lot of these movies terrible. A John McEnroe cameo. You're forgetting him. You could put... We, but are you saying Happy Gilmore is terrible? Because Happy I'm Gilmore's going out of these. Like, we have some classic I'm Adam Sandler Happy movies. Happy Gilmore on the senior and tour absolutely. with a back surgery problem. And I want to see that. <laughs> I, I thought we were going back at the argument. Back surgery is hilarious? No, we're going at the argument right. that this is a terrible, terrible, terrible Adam the, the Sandler movie. The question is, the question is, pitch a Netflix's next terrible Adam Sandler movie. I did add to the caveat of it needs to be a Sandler movie. Uh, all three of you do fall into that. But yes, uh, it does still need to be terrible and still Sandler-esque. So yeah. we'll go around for final thoughts. I'll start with you, Mark. Final thoughts, Why yeah. yours is more terrible Ta and more, more Sandler-esque? More terrible is we are revisiting a old, cliched Adam Sandler thing, we, what he did with Jack and Jill, which is he's just playing himself, but with like different kind of costumes, maybe longer hair. That's why you get these clones. They all have a little bit of a different personality, but come on, it's Adam Sandler. He's going to do the same shtick, and then times that by 10, and they don't know which is the original and which is the clone. I mean... Awful. Josh? You, what, here's the thing. Nobody wants to reboot Happy Gilmore. It's the perfect movie. Everybody always talks about that as his greatest movie. So what are you going to do? You're going to take your childhood and just step on it by making Happy Gilmore the senior tour? He can't play golf as well because he had back surgery? His his new sponsors aren't Subway? Julie Bowen left him years ago? Shooter McGavin is back on the senior tour? 75 cameos per movie? Does that not sound awful? Go, Happy Gilmore it's is great. Happy Gilmore <laughs> sequel. Happy Gilmore I'm the watching. senior the tour. I you describe it, the more I actually want this to happen. Yeah. <laughs> Son a of a sequel. bitch. I'm better than Adam Sandler. <laughs>
God damn it. Uh, Harry final thoughts? Yeah. Any any living, breathing human being out there can only handle so much Adam Sandler, especially so much recent Adam Sandler. And when you put a whole bunch of Adam Sandler characters into one movie, it is bound to be terrible, especially when you add the live action animation part, because who's seen very many good ones of those? So picture lots of Adam Sandlers fighting little minions and your head's going to explode. All right, wow. Well, you guys did a great job pitching terrible movies. Dan, how, what are they saying online? Well, if my calculations are correct, 75 cameos per act would equal 225 cameos. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're welcome. It's the most uh, in movie history. One quick cleanup with Taylor Lautner. Uh, I, I I know that these are cinematic classics, so I'm sure this was not a mistake. It was in Grown Ups 2, not oh, uh, the first oh, Grown Ups. Way yeah. to go, oh, Perry. Yeah. Yeah. Also, Ridiculous Straight 6, right? Yeah. Uh, or 7, the, whatever, whatever that is. Also, in Valentine's Day. Uh, but that's not a... People... Uh, people uh, on Twitter generally just uh, reviling whatever universe it is that these movies would exist in. Lang Liam Neely says, oh wow, at, at P. Nimerov just pitched the apocalypse. <laughs> Sarah Wendling says, I'm enjoying how far in these spiders are leaning to the Sandler question. They are all sadly believable movies. Duke Devil 95, <laughs> wow, and people thought Iron Fist was bad. These movies would make me drop Netflix. So, mm. all right, burn. so they stole, all three have sold our, our audience on the terribleness of their films. All mm. right, well now it comes down, and there's a poll? Oh, there is a poll. Okay, which well, let me. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you all did a terrible job. I, I'll be honest. The one that sounds the most Netflix to me is Marks. Yeah. That one actually sounds like it might get made. <laughs> it's just really depressing. We're in development right now, Andy. So, so I really kudos, can't say more. Maybe should write one. Yeah. Uh, but that. No offense. I know you were doing it terrible, but that sounded terrible. Mm. Uh, so it came down to Perry and Josh. But yeah, Josh, the more you kept talking, the better it sounded in a weird way. <laughs> So sadly, I gotta go with Perry in, in and Josh. In total reversal of fortune on movie fights, Josh, I owe you my best movie. But I, how's this for promise? I'm bringing you back for another episode so you can try this again because I was Andy. very impressed. My one but round, Josh, I did you're it. out. I did it, guys. Round of applause though for Josh yeah. McCool. Yeah. Very good try. Oh man, these mugs are great been though. Best, if it had been best Sandler, uh, you would have won. Yeah, thanks. Uh, but Mark, you win the round because I thought yours was the closest to being a Netflix movie. I'll take it. Perry, you're still in this. You're still here. But now it's time to tackle your next fighter. Uh, Mark, you'll be picking the question now. Okay. Uh, but here we go. If it's uh, any consolation to oh, yeah. Josh, Twitter would like to see or well, not course. like to see Happy Gilmore scene. So 45% voted for Happy Gilmore, 32% the animated Adam Vingers. 23% the Adam, Adam, Adam Spaceler Orphan the ASU, Black. ASU. <laughs> yeah, the ASU. Uh, so you all go. right, here we go. Next fighter, are you ready to go? I'm pulling out. The name is... Christian Christian. How are you? Good to see you. Oh, hello. Welcome. How are you? Hi. Nice to see you, Perry. Christian. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, I know man, we're a little at odds because we're about to we're about to rematch. Oh, I, I respect You've been that you're finally getting back in the showdown. Hey, it can only take me. so many texts so long. I appreciate <laughs> it from, the, from everybody. So thank you. Looking forward to that. No, I'm, it's going to be a lot yeah, of fun. fun. It's going to be good. We're going to play like gentlemen this time. Absolutely. But I'm still going to be a jerk. Yes. Uh, but here we go. Uh, next roundup. So here's the question. Uh, well, yeah, you get to pick the question mark. Let's see All them right. again. These are great mugs, by the way. Yeah, thank I like you. These mugs. They actually are pretty. They're nice and big too. All right, Mark, you get to pick the next question. Great. I want who's the best all-time movie monster. Okay. Pick oh, yeah. Yeah, Ooh, yeah. Ooh, I like this. Yeah, yeah. Best movie monster. I'm going to represent some Collider Nightmares here and go with the And you get monster. to go first. All right, good, because the best movie monster of all time, hands down, is the alien xenomorph from the Alien series. And here's why. Alien is just now getting started with another movie in Alien Covenant, with Ridley Scott teasing Alien Awakening, the sequel, and another trilogy after that. So if you go back to Alien and Aliens, they are one of the highest rated on Rotten Tomatoes right now. Alien, Aliens is highest at 98%. If you go up against other movies like Pacific Rim with 70%, Super 8, 82%, even Gremlins at 85%, and the big daddy of them all, Godzilla at 74%, then you take Alien and Aliens, and I know Alien vs. Predator it besmirked the Alien name. However, it made lots of money. Alien and vs. Predator, high up there on the list of all-time box office. When you compare to other monster movies, the Alien is by far one of the greatest designs by H.R. Geiger. It is instantly recognizable. Alien Covenant, the marketing is going back to the basics, showing the alien egg, showing the alien creature with simply saying, run. That, 
tells you everything. Fans are excited for this next movie. I know we have uh, Kong Skull Island out in theaters. We have another Godzilla coming. But Alien is this movie franchise. We keep getting them. We keep getting them. The, the, the Rotten Tomatoes score should tell you with the Alien and Aliens has set the standard for this movie. We're going back to it with Covenant. The box office is only going to get bigger and bigger with all these movies coming up next. Perry, you're next. I am going to go with The Fly. Mm. I liked your pick, Riley, but I have to say The Fly, one of the coolest things about The Fly is that every single major cinematic monster icon out there has had, almost everyone, has had some sort of flub. It's, it's had its AVP or something that tarnishes its reputation. The first Fly is incredible. Jeff Goldblum or Vincent Price? Mm-hmm. <sighs> I was I was trying to get the fly in general, but I'm gonna go I'll, if I have to pick between the two. Yeah, I'm gonna, which alien I, are you going I will with? I go too? bundle fly. Okay, from uh, Jeff Cole. Okay. Yes. And then which alien are we gonna base this off of? From Alien, Aliens. Which one do you want to pick? Uh, I'm gonna go highest rated in Aliens. Okay. Well, going Many back, aliens. going back off of what you were saying, you Riley, can still use your other ones, but I just want to make sure we're yeah. all focused on one. Movie. The reason that the fly is such an incredible movie monster is because it's hands down pretty much one of the only relatable movie monsters out there. The fly isn't just scary because of the way, another incredible design, by the way, isn't just scary because of the way he looks and that he's super creepy. It's that a person was completely destroyed. He destroyed himself by his own ambition, and you could see that in the fly in his performance when he gets super creepy. He's terrifying to look at, and his whole character journey is absolutely mortifying. Yet another instance where a character is so memorable, iconic, and successful that they're looking at making another version. I don't know if you could really top Rundle fly the that the fly movie is pretty impeccable and god that creeps me out as, as an ambitious person when i think about what he goes through in that movie and what he turns out to be it scares you and it makes you think about yourself sometimes all right christian i love both those choices i think those are really great choices and i would have been intimidated if you uh, but you guys didn't pick the guy the only one with king in the title and that's king kong he is the there's a reason why he's king kong because he is the monster of all monsters and if we want to go with the 33 version then let's go with that one because what we did with king kong because you talk about relatable king kong is very relatable because he's someone he's basically he is in his environment and he is disrupted by people that should not be in his home he's defending his home he's defending against these, these other monsters, by the way, and he is plucked out and put into another environment when he's on the Empire State Building, and you just feel for him in general for what he has been through. And he's sitting there, and everyone remembers it. It is the it is the movie upon movies that you first saw, and you realize that this is 1933 when special effects. It, it, you talk the first time when you see that the clinician, the way that they did everything back then, the way that they just put him on stage. You believe that it was real, and we're also talking about fights here. If we're going to go the best movie monster, if you put the three of them in there, King Kong stepping on both of these things. And just with no problem eating them, stepping on them, chewing them. It's not even an appetizer. It's calamari for him. So he is he is going he is absolutely one of the best. I was worried that one of you was gonna say Godzilla because that would have been a fight for me. Godzilla versus King Kong, because that's the reason why they're continuously using King Kong in these big monster movies. The monster boom started to happen once again with Universal. And why is it happening? What do they need to do? They needed to have legendary kind of merge with Universal and um and with Warner Brothers because they had to see Godzilla versus who? The best of the best, King Kong. He's the best monster of all time. All right, find it out, guys. Okay, I'll, I'll say this. I would love to see. The reason I picked aliens is because I have multiple aliens, and I have an alien queen. And if I get to impregnate all of Earth, I can take on <laughs> King Kong with my aliens. They have numbers, my friend. They can take it. They can go up that. They can take on Kong. That would be a good fight. I want to see that. Whether they win or not, I don't know. But... What I'm doing is the best monster of all time. Not, and I'm going to box office, I'm going to Rotten Tomato scores, and the two that you, keep, uh, with The Fly and with King Kong that you keep mentioning is relatable. I don't want my monsters relatable, I want them scary. And at the same point, what I love about my aliens is I haven't relied on a reboot or a remake since. It is a continuation of the series. The Fly is now getting remade again. King Kong has been remade again from the remake, from the remake, from the remake. So I like that this franchise is still going and still so popular that we're able to reinvent it, go back in time, go forward in time. That's what's great about the alien because what the alien does is put that fear in you, which I love in my monster movies. And then that puts the focus on great characters like Ripley, like Catherine Watterson, who's coming in for Co Covenant and Michael Fassbender. These are movies that get great characters alongside these monsters. Relatable is a different type. 
archetype of horror, though. Relata yeah, absolutely relatable is. is one that gets in your head and it sticks there and it makes you think about yourself. It makes you think about the characters. Whereas when I'm thinking about King Kong, you know, stomp, 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 bash stuff up, and, and then that's kind of it. A Alien, Alien freaks me out quite a bit. I, I don't is. think I can knock that too much just because if I didn't go with the fly, I would have gone with Alien. Mm. Yeah, but the thing is with the fly is that he's defeated pretty easy here. And it, yeah. he's, he's got he's got one mission, really, and that's just he, with, he, he, it's, he doesn't even, he, it's humanity at first, and then he loses humanity, and that's scary for a second, but he's defeated pretty easily. There's no fight. We're also not and as talking as, about scary, though. We're talking about the best, about the the, the best of all time. And when of you all, look at the I fly agree. compared to all the other monsters there, the fly is good. He's unique. The fly is good. But if you're going to put him in a top five of all time, if you took 30 people together and said, who's the best of all time? I don't think the fly is even remotely interested. Is it a good movie? Yeah. And you're mentioning box office and stuff, too. Great. Box office is amazing. We want to talk about box office? How about all the people that wanted to come to watch Kong uh, in the theater because he was this spectacle. He was this thing. Yeah. And then don't mess with Kong because he is out of his environment. And, and you think he's not scary? He eats people. Oh, yeah. He eats people. He ate a bunch of people in front of him. I don't want to go near that. If, if we want to jump to Skull Island, the first thing he does when he's protecting everything, he starts like, it's like, yeah, he's protecting. Oh, he's a good dude, but he just killed and ate everyone. So he is very <laughs> scary. And you said, well, I'm not sure if aliens win. I'm sure Kong would win. I am sure <laughs> in comedy because that's what Kong also had. Kong has confidence. Kong, uh, when he was the smaller version of Kong, still went up against the biggest of the best with the dinosaurs, whether it's the 33 or even the Peter Jackson version. He is always confident. He is always ready to protect. And the thing that brought him down was that he was protecting, whether it's Fay Ray or Naomi Watts, he's always protecting the girl too. Is he relatable? Yeah, he's relatable, but he's also he's scary and he is the king for a reason. It's King Kong. He's the I'd best. love to know. Go back through as we're wrapping this up. But like, wh why is yours the best movie monster? The question again: all time best movie monster. It's not best well, franchise. I think. It's I I think, think for king what's, tell me why. Who's the best all time movie monster? Well, I, I think for King Kong, the, the reason why he's the best is because he set what we know from monster movies. Again, that thirty three, the version when it came out in the beginning. There was it, you had to believe that these things could exist, and he and it, it start, it's like anything, like whether Star Wars is a, is a movie that that set the the space opera, and then people started to do it, and even Mark's movie with Alien, that, that came from like Star Wars being first a popular thing. King Kong was the first; he was there; he was the one; he was he is the ultimate one to be there before even Godzilla. He is the ultimate movie monster because he set the stage for everything, even today, from Pacific Rim and all those things. They all stem from what Kong is about. I can't argue with that, but I can say that Aliens became a part of this conversation by being in the all-time monster movie category. You're going to get that in your top 10. I would even argue you would get in your top five because of the iconic visage that is that alien. The minute you see it, that's why Covenant now is doing the marketing with that poster and seeing it because people, want, they know it right away, just like they know King Kong. Yes. I can say that as well. But they know this alien right away. And we are not, again, I think the biggest lasting impression that the aliens have done is that we're not relying on a remake. We can continue to go and reinvent this franchise over and over again because the one thing Alien does is scare the crap out of you every time. I think to, to quote our buddy Hal Rudnick, uh, both the Alien and Kong are iconic. Iconic. So, exactly. so is Brundlefly and why he's one of the best move monsters in movies of all time is because it is it's not just an alien it's not just a creature he is a person who is transformed and it's mortifying and that's a movie and that's a performance and that's creature design that is set a certain standard that a lot of try a lot of other movies are trying to live up to but all in unique ways you know you bring up uh you bring up godzilla and king kong and you're comparing the two like oh no if, if you had said the other one then then i would have been worried and that kind of the same thing with uh, alien at this point too you really can't have a deep space movie anymore without being like, oh, like, how does it weigh against Alien? Whereas the fly will always just be the fly. There's so little that can stack up with that. Well, it's just that Kong and Godzilla are always part of the conversation in monster movies. And that's why when you say, when you put them together, the first thing you think, that's why I was pretty shocked when that wasn't the first one uh, that was announced. These are your final thoughts. Go ahead. Yeah, it, because when you think of the greatest monster movies, there are ones that are coming up there. And like you said, Perry, I think that the fly is, is a fantastic monster. I think it's great. It's just not in the upper echelon. If I had a Hall of Fame, my Mount Rushmore. Kong's there first and Godzilla's right next to him. And Final I would say that Alien is right up there with it. Yeah, Fly, I love because of the character, because of the, the legacy of this movie, especially the Jeff Goldblum, Gina Davis movie. But that is more of a, a very small point of the genre. Like, genre fans love that movie. But if you go to the audience, you're going to say... 
Godzilla, you're going to say Kong, you're going to say aliens. And that's where I'm standing with aliens. Final yeah, thoughts? I'm definitely sticking with the fly. So maybe if you polled 10 people, every single one of them wouldn't put mm. the fly in the top 10. But that's not what the question is. It's it's what is the best monster? And when you're talking about character development and how he fits into the actual movie that he's in, unforgettable. All right. Oh, good Barry. fight. Yeah. Yeah. Barry. Bam! All right, Dan, any cleanup? Well, people online, of course, uh, people watching at home have so many monsters that I've seen. The general consensus, a lot of people saying uh, the shark from Jaws. Uh, uh, But the one that many, many that I saw the most was The Thing from uh, Carpenter's movie, The Thing. Um, um, Riley using some selective rotten tomatoing for his alien (laughs) movie. Just the ones that count. Yeah, there were some other alien movies that perhaps did not do as well. Oh, yeah, no, I mentioned it. The Alien vs. Predator, Predator, I mentioned, is not being great. Or Alien Resurrection, sure, Dan. Alien vs. Predator 2 or (laughs) Alien 3 are all rotten. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. But Prometheus is fresh. Yeah. um, On Rotten Tomatoes. (laughs) Uh, yeah, but but King Kong at ninety eight percent and the Fly at ninety one percent, no slouches in the Rotten Tomato <laughs> departments either. Um, but factually, you know, pretty pretty clean round. Uh, a lot of people just I, I think there's so many opportunities to, to answer that a lot of people just have their own favorites. <sighs> okay, this one's tough for me. Uh, yeah, so summing it up, I think you know there were two more iconic ones, as you said, that sort of then became the, a lot of the talk. But the question was the best movie monster. And I think one of you got too hung up on the franchise and didn't focus on the specific monster. And Perry, I thought you actually did a really great, great breakdown, breaking down why that's so terrifying that he's a person tra- that, that when you said it, it just it all clicked with me of why that's great. And then Christian, you really gave me a lot about the history and, and his, the feelings and the relatability. But Mark, I think you got too hung up on box office, franchise numbers, things. And yes, if we're if we're arguing what's the most popular a monster, you might have won. But I didn't hear enough specifics as to why the queen, the specific queen, and her what she does and why the eggs. Like I just didn't get any specifics to the monster. So I got to give Mark the couch. Damn. Oh. Oh. A very good fight. I, I, I disagree with that decision. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Andy. I, I'm well sure the internet will as well. But Perry and Christian, you're still in this. The winner of this round is tough. I'm going to give it to Perry. Nice. I think Perry did a really nice. strong Perry. argument as to why it was a stronger right. monster. And then, uh, it, and I think she was up against the ropes a little bit. So I'm going to give you the edge on that. Nice. So and Christian, well you're still here. Uh, but Mark, great round. Uh, thank you for doing that. Moving on to round three. What, oh, what did the poll say, Dan? I'm sure, I, I'm sure it was not... No, the poll voted 64% for the Xenomorph from Aliens, oh, wow. 29% for the original King Kong, only 7% supporting the fly. But, Thanks uh, to the 7%. As we remind, yeah. it's about the arguments. It's, it's about not the about argument. the choice. So there you go. All right, here we go. Next up, Wendy Lee. Wendy. 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 <laughs> Come on down. You're the next contestant on Movie Fights. Dun, 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 dun. Da, 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 da. I didn't know I was gonna get my own mug. Yeah, no. we got we got oh. so many mugs. Don't forget mugs. I forget the Can I keep it? Uh, I don't no. know. How many, I don't think we have that many mugs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm a drink from it at least. You can order one though for ten dollars. <laughs> I will. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure we can get you. If you win, it's 15. Um, uh, Yeah. uh, All right. You get to pick the question, Perry, since you won. Let's see the questions again. Pretty sure I know what I'm going with again this time. And I'm going to take number four. Nice. Ooh, our our title bout. Very excited about that one. Who should be Josh Whedon's Joss Whedon's Batgirl? Now, this was a surprise story. Mm -hmm. Out of nowhere. Did not see this coming. I'm excited. It could be interesting. Who knows? DC has a lot of things in the hopper, so where does this live with everything else? A lot of questions that we can answer, but for this fight, who do we want to see in Joss Whedon's Batgirl? Perry, you get to go first. Oh, I'm so excited about my answer because I'm such a big fan of this actress. It's Anya Taylor-Joy. And if you haven't seen her movies, you're missing out. It is a shock to me that she is not already the next big thing. She first broke out in The Witch, where she almost carries that movie. It's a great ensemble, but that movie is scary for the most part because of her reaction and what she's going through in that movie. Then you also have Morgan, which might have not been the greatest movie overall, but damn, does she work that title character. And right there is the perfect example of her physically being able to embody this role. And then, most recently, you have Split, a huge box office hit that now makes my fan casting actually possible. People are starting to know her name. She's a really talented actress. And when you pair a rising star like her with an accomplished director like Joss Whedon, I think you could have the perfect pairing here. 
Christian, you're up next. Yeah, for me, I think that Barbara Gordon needs to have a little bit of of a personality. You know, when she's not in the suit, and she's not as she's not really going to be uh, as dark as say Batman is. That's never been the character of Batgirl. And I think someone that can be able to kick ass and also have that lighter side is Lily James. I think Lily James would be a great choice for Batgirl. Obviously, if you didn't see her in Cinderella, she's got a, she's got a, a lighter side there to where she can hit the emotional side of things. But if you want to see her kick ass, you might not like the movie. But Pride and Prejudice with Zombies, she was in, and she made it believable. She made it. I, I when she was kicking ass. I was like, okay, great. I could see her being in this kind of movie and making it realistic. I can see her fighting crime. I can see her doing these things. And she kind of fits the role and kind of looks like um, Barbara Gordon for me. You give her, maybe give her some red hair here and there, but uh, however you want to color her hair. But I think that she is going to, she's an actress. She's up and coming. She's likable. And I think that she is a perfect fit for Barbara Gordon. Wendy? My pick for Joss Whedon's Batgirl is Haley Steinfeld. Yeah. Uh, I loved her in Edge of Seventeen. She is a little bit newer on the scene, seeing her in Pitch Perfect, um, and now in Edge of Seventeen. And like Christian said, I think she can give Barbara Gordon that spice of personality when she's not in the suit. Also, I think she's super adaptable. She's young. She seems athletic. I think she can totally kick butt as Batgirl. And I just don't think Hollywood has had enough of her yet. She's this up and coming to me, and I think she's uber talented, and I would love to see her as a redhead. Wow, if this was like the, the short list that it's a great list. was it's a released good list. tomorrow, list, yeah. breaking tomorrow. Absolutely thrilled. Um, even though I love both both of these choices, I would still pick Anya over them. You know, Haley Steinfeld's great, and clearly she gave a fantastic performance in Edge of Seventeen. Just, you know, based on everything I've seen her in, maybe other than True Grit, she's kind of fallen into that, you know, the quirky, Juno-esque type roles, and I'm wondering if something like that would, would bleed into here, because I don't think that would really suit the movie too well. And then with Lily James, the only apprehension I have about that is, I love Pride and Prejudice and Zombie. The, the book, and I was really looking forward to that adaptation. I just don't think she's really had the chance to, to shine in a fully successful movie where I think Anya would be just the safer bet. Well, this is my point. The whole reason why she would have a chance to shine is because she's going to be working with Joss Whedon because as much as I like Anya Taylor, uh, I think that the thing she hasn't shown that she has comedy chops at all, and Joss Whedon loves comedy. Mm -hmm. Joss Whedon loves to show that he can throw in those one-liners but still have very strong female leads, and all these choices are all f strong female leads, but I I think Lily James fits the criteria of what Joss Whedon can do. And that's why I bring up Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, because that is a, if Joss Whedon had been announced to direct that movie, I'd be like, well, that makes sense. I could see that happening. And that's a perfect fit. You could see him kind of shaping her. I like Haley Steinfeld very much. I just don't know yet if she has proven as far as an action side has gone and how much, I, I liked Edge of 17 very much and even True Grit. She can go dramatic, but I want to see what her, her physicality is. I don't know yet. I assume it could be good, but I don't know. Morgan, uh, Anya was very good in that movie. I just don't think she has that light, the, the light tone yet that, that needs to be pulled out of her. I haven't seen that, going yeah. over what you were saying. So no, That's a, a similar point. I think we've seen such well-rounded and such diverse performances from her. Why wouldn't she be able to take comedy direction from someone like Joss Whedon? And every single person I've ever seen her interact with, it's like a really rich relationship there. So that is only going to help her when, when you're talking about pulling something different out of her performance in that kind of setting. She's, She's the main girl in... Uh, in Morgan uh, and, and, uh, and, and the Witch. Split? And the Witch. Yeah. Yeah. Split. 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 She's the main She's girl. The main girl. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I haven't seen Witch yeah. or Morgan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you both talked about comedy chops, and as we can see from Edge of Seventeen, Haley Seinfeld it's got and Definitely. pitch perfect she's got plenty of it yeah, she does. and just going from what we've seen in the past with Joss Whedon's TV character like Buffy like um, Dollhouse and things like that I think she fits right into that that character and for me I think and I loved Anya Taylor-Joy and I love Lily James and I think they're both athletic as well however I think the movies that they've been in say for um, Pride and Prejudice and mm -hmm. Zombies have been a little bit more serious and I think Haley is just a little bit more flexible and she's already shown us that she can be funny. She can sing. I think she's got this. Well, I think you need to blend for sure. And then and if I, you know, if I had to decide whether it was, uh, if I was out and it was Haley Steinfeld or Anya, I, I'm going Haley Steinfeld there because of the comedy element. And like you said, she, we, you just, you're assuming that she can do comedy. 
if comedy was that easy, everybody would be doing it. So I, I, she, I don't know if she's going to be able to pull that comedy. And to work with Joss Whedon, you have to. And I'm not talking about slapstick. But there is a what the DC Cinematic Universe is doing now is they're taking a shift. They're going to plan B. They're doing new things. That's why you're bringing in a guy like Joss Whedon to do this stuff. And he's going to bring in somebody like a Lily James because she is not super well known. But she wants you, he, he takes chances on people, whether it's Sarah Michelle Gellar or whoever's going to people that you have not seen before. Put them in these iconic roles. He will make her Batgirl. She will shine in that role because Cinderella was an iconic character already. She fit that role like that, like, also, well, like a slipper, if you will. But she was she was <laughs> great in that role, and I think she would become Batgirl. I'll pull the like reins that. on the comedy a little. Obviously, with Joss Whedon in the director's chair, you would think that that movie would have some comedy to it. There's just nothing in the report to say, oh, he's going to put a focus on the comedy. This is a must for this role. So with that in mind, I think your best shot in terms of having a well-rounded actress that is most likely to crush this role, I think Anya Taylor-Joy has now proven herself three times over. So she's just the safer bet. And, you know, I love Haley Steinfeld, too. She's super funny. I'm, I'm just not convinced on the actual action part of the movie because I've yeah, never I'm really a, yeah. seen her mm-hmm. do right. that kind of combat before. And Lily, Lily James is great. I think she does make every role her own to a point. The only thing that I could say that possibly would make Anya a better pick is that a lot of the movies that she's been in, they're, they're period costume dramas. So there's so much going on around her that that could be elevating her performance. Whereas Anya's been in movies that are almost kind of like the bare minimum. And there's a lot of great things and characters and things happening around her. But those movies just showcase her versatility as an actress. I'm going to use that final thoughts. Are you good? Anything else you want to I'm add? I'm good. Uh, Christian, final thoughts? Yeah, my final thoughts is too. I think that we, we're talking about three solid actresses, three yes. up-and-coming actresses, but I think that you also have got to look at whether, and I am going to hark on the on the thing of comedy. You say we don't know if he's going to. Every movie he's ever done, Joss Whedon, has had comedy elements. It's how he writes, and you want someone that can deliver that, but you also want someone who can kick ass. She showed that with Pride and Prejudice, but the thing with Lily James also is that she does seem to be a little bit more versatile. I think I think even the roles that she has done, there has been a switch to where, yeah, she's been in period pieces, but I didn't, I, she really changed her role as who she was in Cinderella to who she was in Pride and Prejudice. You felt the character. I didn't see Lily James. I saw her, and I'll see Barbara Gordon when Lily James is doing it. Wendy, final thoughts? And for me, I think Haley has the comedy child down, as we can already see, and she is someone who hasn't been as many movies as Anna taylor George or as Lily James. So I think she is someone who can grow with the bad girl as we as we can see her reprise as Barbara Gordon and bad girl in other films beyond the bad girl movie. All right, this is tough. Dan, thoughts? Uh, well, uh, as usual, uh, so many names being thrown out on Twitter. Uh, uh, Tim Butner says uh, Sarah Sharonin would make mm. a fantastic yeah. bad girl. She was great in Hannah. Uh, Jeff Weiss uh, says Tatiana Mis- Mislani. Yeah. Mislani. Yeah, uh, TJ Dex, uh, Jane Levy is the best choice for Joss Whedon's uh, bad girl. What she showed in Don't Breathe says it all. Jessica says Jenna Malone for bad girl. Anthony mm. Hernandez says I'm going to go with Shane Lee Woodley because I want to see her interact with J.K. Simmons in a father-daughter relationship. <laughs> we don't know if J.K. Simmons will be in this movie. Uh, but uh, so many more. Like A lot of people very excited and throwing out some great names for this. Uh, we have the Twitter poll also, which is very close right now. So we'll see how it how it So uh, yeah, I think I think Christian, you were my leader. I think you just did gave me the best of both worlds. Whereas Perry, they knocked you on the comedy, which I think was fair, and then Wendy, they knocked her on action, which I think is fair with Haley. And I didn't hear much how to defend that, and you were sort of showcasing her singing, which I think will partake here. <laughs> I don't know why I got stuck on, like, Chris <laughs> She Perfect. is a good singer. <laughs> we were listening to music on the way here. So I, I, I listened to it, too. It's good. very good. Hey, you never know. They had Buffy the Musical. That's true. They did. More with they, feeling. Did. they did. Uh, and then, Perry, you did, you did hit back, at least a good enough back with the, uh, well, we don't know if it's comedy. So I, I'm grasping at straws, but because I... I think I heard a little bit more as to why the comedy could work and the action can't. Sadly, Wendy, I'm gonna pull you out. Uh, Wendy, sorry, that was fantastic round. Good work. Good debut, and please, we're gonna have you back. This was fun. Thank you. Good. Leaving this. You can can hold your mug. You can take your mug. Take Take your mug. Take the mug. Uh, Take the mug. Take the mug. Uh, Wow. All right, but Christian, I'm gonna give you the win on that. Okay, Perry, you're still here though. Ooh, this is intense. We're in a. What was the? uh, What did they say online, Dan? We're in like a three-way tie on the Twitter poll. It's like it's literally right now 35% to 33% to 32%, and it keeps changing. So pretty equal uh, support for all of these choices on Twitter. I got right, a, great. I Dennis, got a funny Ken, and John, next. one of you is coming up next. Let's see gotcha. who we pick. Who do you think? I, I'll, I'll wait to see. I, I have I, a hand. Who do you think it is? You, you I think bet. it's Ken. I think, think it's Dennis. 
It is... Schnapp! 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 You really, you really oh. screwed him on that. I know. Delicious <laughs> Walter. There he is. John Schnapp, hey. welcome back to the show. What's going on? You're no stranger here. That's right. All right, so, Christian, you get to pick the first topic. All right, let's do it. Let's see the questions again. We have three left. All right. All right. Uh, what is Hugh Jackman's best non-Wolverine role? Let's do that. All right. So that means you get to go first. Harry will be second. John, you're going to be third. All right. yeah, it's funny. Uh, I was th sorry, when I was thinking about this, it, you, you look at the stuff that he's done, and he's, he's very talented Dude, obviously, but we, we associate him most with Wolverine. You look at the majority, he's got like eight or nine movies, whatever it is. Movies. It's a lot of Wolverine movies. So you're looking, which ones is like the best? And then I looked, there was one movie, I'm like, it's hands down, there's there's no competition, it's Prisoners. Um, Prisoners is a movie that you talk, I mean, and being a parent and watching this movie, you always watch the way someone is going to react as a parent in any situation, whether it's a lighthearted role or if it's something tragic like this. And he hits a, he gets into a place that, as an actor, there are not a lot of people that can do that, actors or actresses. He makes you feel for things. You understand his desperation from the start to finish. You can tell how well he works with um, with directors and everything he did, and what directors can get out of him because he's he's from what you hear also about as far as being an easygoing guy. He's able to connect here, and his and his accent disappears. By the way, it's just gone. He's just he's really good in everything, but his. Is, that, that's his that's his best role outside of Wolverine for sure. Oh my. Perry. I was sure you were going to pick what I was going for and I'm going Jean Valjean from yeah. Les Mis because it's, close. it's his best actor nominee. I mean it's it's his best performance on Academy standards and I mean really he is incredible in that movie whether you're talking about just his work as a dramatic actor, talking and connecting with all the other characters, because it's his relationship. He is the he is the focal point of that ensemble movie, and he carries it so damn well. Then you can go and talk about his singing. He is an incredible singer. Everything in this movie that he does is spot on. And then on top of that, when you think about all of just like the heart and emotions and how his dad inspired him to take this role and to take it to the level that he did, and how much weight he lost, and then he had to put it back on. I mean, really, this thing is one heck of an accomplishment. I am so glad he got that Academy Award nomination because he deserved it. John. You know, I was going to go with Scoop. Uh, but I'm not, oh, sorry. I was going to go with Scoop, and then I thought about Swordfish, where he's like doing that, like, I'm in! <laughs> I've done it! But I'm not going to pick those. Are, those are just too easy. Um, I agree with Le Miz. It's a fantastic film. I, I loved all the performances. My favorite performance was Anne Hathaway's out of that film. Um... But I gotta, I gotta go with uh, the fountain. That's the one. After looking all at all of his uh, his entire uh, uh, work, which is you know he's done so many amazing films and some you know ones you could skip like Kate and Leopold or like Australia. I never saw that. I'm not planning on seeing it. I've been to Australia. He's but actually that's a, pretty good in it. I'm sure he's ama he's amazing in everything. So it's like I mean you know Logan made me you know get teary eyed. The last film that uh, Hugh Jackman made me get teary eyed was The Fountain, and not only is it because he portrays three completely different characters within the same movie, but it's all about life and death, and it's really this entire journey from beginning to end, not just early, you know, going through time as these different characters, but his travel, the main characters travel through the beginning and of life and death with his true love. So, to me, I think The Fountain was not just a much more personal and emotional film. Uh, from Darren Aronofsky, but also a more personal and emotional performance from Hugh Jackman. Now, we all know that he's really good at doing song and dance and musicals and things like that, but the guy is really, he's like such a multi-tiered performer that for myself, The Fountain is the one that resonates. All right, guys, fight it out. I mean, I think, look, the thing is, with, with your performance, too, it's the only time I've heard him on Hollywood Reporter where he said he wished he would have done a couple things different. Mm -hmm. There were things that he wished that he would have, he, that he didn't like, that he would have changed up a lot of his performance. As far as Les Mis goes, Les Mis is, he's great in that movie. And, but like Schnepp pointed out, too, we knew that he could do musicals. We knew that he was talented before. Prisoners is something that we didn't know he could go there. You're talking about emotional. You're talking about where you can go and, and the depth of what you can go to. The fact of having a missing child and making that believable was not he's just acting he didn't, he wasn't acting that guy he was in that movie you saw him he connected you and when you have a director like Denis Villeneuve 
instructing you, and he brings out. We've seen what Ivanov has done with uh, DiCaprio, and or, or, and the fact that he is now uh, doing that with uh, not with, with, uh, with Del Toro, what he did with Del Toro. Excuse me, what he did with Del Toro, and what he and what he's able to pull out now with Hugh Jackman. Hugh Jackman was able to just get something that we had never seen him do before, and that's why I think Prisoners is hands down. I don't best. know if it's necessarily about something that we haven't seen them do before, and he, and even if I guess you take that approach, like yes, we know he sang. But we've never seen a performance this gritty, I think, from him. Yeah, where the prisoners where is he, just pretty gritty. Well, where Australia, he, where guys. Be, that's really. Yeah, that's true. I'm not going to let that one. It's not, it's not <laughs> that bad. I'm just saying, that's Hugh some Jackman's grit. Jackman's pretty good in it's it. Gritty. But also, just when you think about. I, I mean, I'll keep going back to the Academy Award because that pretty much validates why this is the best performance. But then you could also look at just the production and the shoot of Les Mis and the situation he's in. You're talking about Denis Villeneuve bringing something out of him. And yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure that happened. I didn't read any interviews on him. But I imagine that'd be the case. With Les Mis, though, they were doing all the live singing on set. It wasn't the greatest conditions. He's walking around with a headache and malnourished the entire sure. time. What he was able to give and how much he's able to emote and just the epicness of that character journey. I mean, you talk, you talk about someone playing one character. It is not easy to take a character from the point where he starts that movie to where he ends and make that journey feel cohesive. And every step of the way, he always reminds you of what he's experienced in the past. And that's why that character, just in general, is so Iconic. I gotta, I gotta say, yeah. uh, Le Miz, I always think of Russell Crowe standing on the edge of a building, right, like, right. because I'm in a play, I'm in a musical, I'm standing on the edge of a building. That to me, but I love Russell Crowe. Just Crow. like him. Yeah. 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 I am Russell Crowe and I am singing. Yeah. But he was fantastic. He should have got that Oscar nomination. <laughs> Let me just say something about Oscar nominations: how useless and meaningless they are. So many people <laughs> so get history. nominated. I don't care. So many people get nominated and even win Oscars, and then years later, you never mention that movie Ever. or that role again. It's the people who actually are in movies that never get mentioned again. Those are the movies that you're watching late at night. Like, holy fuck, The Fountain, that's an amazing well, movie. Well, those, took, are the, those are the films that actually stand the test of time. I could mention oh, Blade Runner. I could mention I so many that, I could mention so many other movies that have never been nominated. But you were mentioning Oscar nominated for Le Mis. He was fantastic in Le Mis, but I don't care if he was nominated or not. I think he just did a great performance, just like Russell Crowe. Yeah. And just like Anne Hathaway. I think so it's you, a fit. you got the one-two well, punch there. No, but I, I think I think what, what I agree with Schnepp there on the on the first half of that is that with there is a lot that it comes with with the first half of that movie and with Anne Hathaway, Russell Crowe, all the I mean uh, Eddie Redmayne too, uh, the yeah. little kid. Eddie there was Redmayne. there was so much that that people are adding because he there were certain things there were certain times that it was actually on Hugh Jackman's shoulders and he and he when he when he hit he knocked out of the park but it wasn't all on his shoulders. The two uh, both Gyllenhaal and Hugh Jackman Hugh Jackman led us into this emotional roller coaster, put the weight of the world on his shoulders, on our shoulders watching, and then leaned on Gyllenhaal to help him out. And you also, he, he enhanced Gyllenhaal's uh, performance. It was the two of those guys, but with uh, Jackman leading the charges, where the ensemble, like Schnepp pointed out, and I agree with him, it, it, great movie. I love the performance, and I loved him in that. But let me also add that what you're talking about, you're, what you're saying is it's not just Hugh Jackman's role, it's Jake Gyllenhaal's I'm role, I'm saying it's Hugh Jackman's but with, was the lead of it and led you the into The Fountain, it. he is the role. It's not like him and Gyllenhaal team it up. The Fountain is all Hugh Jackman, well, and he plays way, characters what's throughout. What's the emotional journey of that movie? Another. The emotional journey of the of the Fountain, yeah. for myself, at least what I took out of it, of him, is for him though, his for, arc. His arc yeah. was dealing with his wife's death from the beginning of time and dealing with love, love lost through the from the from different perspectives, not just him. He plays different characters yeah. throughout it, but I found it to be like almost meditational. Well, in well, it. well one way or another, it doesn't make any difference whether he was part of an ensemble, he was the lead actor, he was a supporting. As long as it was his best performance, that kind of answers the question, and it really speaks I to his... I agree with you, it's the final. It really speaks to yeah. his... It really does speak exactly to agree. his ability well, I, that he can rise to the occasion and bring an ensemble together while also supporting the movie when and he needs to be the leading man. Yep. I All totally right. agree with what Perry said yeah. about the fountain. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I need to know in your final closing here, I'm asking me, can you do one more? Why is your performance, why are the other two performances not as good as the one you selected? Well, I think the performance Go with ahead, the, Christian, we'll start. I think the performance with the fountain 
And I, I mean, I lean like I mean, if again, I think that Schnepp and I have a similar argument here to where Hugh Jackman had to go to in order to bring out this particular performance. And I do think that the we're both dealing with loss here for our performances. And I, and I am kind of pushing aside uh, Les Mis because it's really it, it even even in ha- Anne Hathaway's small role, she had more of a powerful performance. People talk about Anne Hathaway in that small more than they do Hugh Jackman. Um, Hugh Jackman, I think, is an argument between the two of us. I really do because I think that where we get down to what he does in Prisoners. And I'm going back to that, to the the desperation that you have to see, the fact that he, he almost goes from being a normal dude to killing someone, to find out where, where his daughter is, what it is. He doesn't care if the person's uh, innocent or not because he knows in the heart of hearts he's got to figure out what needs to be done to get his daughter back. And you see it. You feel it. The power is seeping through, whether it's on screen or on television. You feel it because that is the best performance performance he's ever had because you believe him as this parent, the same way that you certainly do uh, at times in The Fountain. I just think because Aronofsky's style overtakes the movie, it overtakes the performance. It's the style. It's Aronofsky is more of the star, and it's more of Aronofsky's shooting that you remember more than you remember any performances. Perry, final thought? With the fa- the fountain's really the only one I cannot <laughs> strictly because just as as a moviegoer that one did not strike me as much as let's say Prisoners or Les Mis did, and with Prisoners I don't want to say it was a bad performance it was a great performance but when I say what was his best performance it doesn't matter if people are talking about Anne Hathaway. That movie was Hugh Jackman's best performance. It was him taking the best of himself as an actor, the best of himself as a person and trying to think about what inspires him and putting it all on screen. Every ounce of himself is in that movie and that's why it's his best. Well, I was going to mention Eddie the Eagle or maybe even his incredible role in Pan, but I'm not going to bring those up. (laughs) Or Real Steel, but... uh, you know, honestly, I, I, I'm I not faulting Lemiz. I mean, uh, like, none of us are out here saying you Jackman sucks. <laughs> We're all like, hey, look, he's been in a couple of shitty films, but overall, most of his films are incredible. I stick by The Fountain because I think that is his best performance, not just because it's his lead performance, but it's because you see him go through different transformations. I personally don't think that Darren Aronofsky's uh, directing overtook the film and made it impersonal for me. In fact, I remember be, feeling very emotionally drawn into it through from the beginning all the way to the end because I connected to the idea of what loss is and being able to read something from a book or a poem and take that with you. And those are the, th- the kind of things that happen through The Fountain. is all about transformation. And for myself, I think that Hugh Jackman transformed through that movie. All right, that was the hardest one yet. Uh, Dan, notes? Very difficult. I'm looking on the uh, on Twitter. There's a winner, and the, there's someone leading in the poll. Uh, Josh Rakuga told me to make sure that you guys did not overlook his fantastic work in the Golden Globe-nominated work in Kate and Leopold. Yeah, yeah. What was the 40? What was the also, I will say that, that John Schnepp's performance as Russell Crowe and Les Mis is getting a lot of Twitter love, Thank a you. lot of uh, yeah. accolades yeah. from the crowd. Oh, the dance over and then uh, Leanne Summers and many others on Twitter, of course. Easy the fourth one, I think, unmentioned in this group of easy ones would be The Prestige. Right. Uh, not yes. mentioned, but many people professing their love for his uh, uh, performance in that movie. But, uh, yeah, Twitter poll as of now has a clear winner, but we'll see if that changes while you do the result. Dan, what did you think? Based on those Ooh, arguments, I need help because I don't want to be – I'm grasping at straws a little bit. No, this is the toughest one of the day. I mean, it's their three great performances. Um I mean, usually I'd pick a winner if I, I mean, if I have to pick somebody that uh, was least effective, was the least effective, right? Everybody put together a really good uh, argument. Uh, oh boy. Yeah. I right? This one sucks. I, here, I'll help you out. I'll help you out with okay. this. I think that, I think that Schnepp would be safe for me, but I don't know the, the other way. It's too, it's too hard for me. It's difficult. It's very hard. <sighs> <laughs> All right. I kind of agree with what Merle was just saying. <laughs> I don't know. Not to play favorites, but it sounds like Dan Merle knows what he's talking yeah. about. <laughs> they kind of, they did kind of gang up on you, Perry, which I was trying I not to let them do. I was trying to listen and not just let because uh, I think they're thre- Christians threatened there especially. I uh, would be threatened by Academy War nomination uh, too. It's so, okay. but, so I was listening, but you know, I did also they did have some good points of just the ensemble nature and that Anne Hathaway's performance was better. Um, the other two films do sort of have them deal with more of loss. It's a d- deeper performance, but yours is the Academy Award nominated performance. I get that doesn't mean anything, but it sort of does. Uh, man, this one's really tough. I got to go based on these arguments. I'm just going through the notes. Sorry to take so long because I want to do this right. Uh, Perry! 
What does that mean? I don't know what those mean. <laughs> <laughs> they lose, they win. What the hell does that mean? Uh, shoot. Uh, I think... See, for me, Christian was safe. Uh-huh. I thought he had some good stuff. And, I, and when he said style overtook the performance of Aronofsky in Fountain, I thought that was a pretty good punch out. Yeah, I, listen, it's close. I'm not saying that John was like, you know, lapped everybody. It's, uh, I think if you talk, I've talked to everyone in the room, they had different opinions. He also pointed out that the fountain was the one who got the notes. So I'm giving Christian the safe. It's down to, to Perry and Schnepp based on these points that I'm reaching out. Ah, uh, oh man, I got a slight edge to Perry. Oh. 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 That's the oh, funniest yeah. argument. I, I was really torn because funniest argument. I'm going to break into the screen, Juggies. I don't want Seb to be mad at me, but there, I've done it. I just got a little bit more from Perry, and uh, uh, I was going to give Perry. you an edge for being oh, funny, my. but I didn't think that was fair. That's, that's every day. <laughs> oh, okay. But Hold man, up. Schnapp, please come uh, back for a regular fight. Here. Please come back for a regular fight. You're one of my favorites. John Schnapp. Oh, skin going. your teeth. So Christian, you get you won that one. Okay. So you're still in this for the first time today, Andy. Uh, the the Twitter poll agrees with you. Fifty three okay. percent chose prisoners. Thirty five percent chose Les Mis, and twelve percent the fountain. That was really tough, John. I, to be honest, that was that was brutal with me. All right, here we go. Next up, Dennis. Dennis. All right. Denny Zen. Dennis Zen. Dennis Zen. I'm a cuckoo. Christian, you get to pick. All right, let's do it. Let's see the, what questions are left. We still have a blind fight in there. Are you going to save it for the end? Or are you going to ask, in honor of the boss baby, what movie <laughs> character you'd most want as your boss? No, you know what? Because I I, I'm, 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 I know what I'm going to I'm going with strategy here. Okay. Because I got that drunk movie fights champion <laughs> waiting in the background. And I know that he would be dangerous in this category. So I'm going for this one now. Uh, I'll go for the which movie boss. Okay, yeah. you are taking the movie yeah, boss off the table. He had something prepared, that creep. I can see him back there. <laughs> <laughs> He's, He's so bummed. He's screaming at <laughs> I mean, yeah. He was ready he for was. it. He was. He's screaming oh, at me to go I Look at this thing. This thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you get, karma. He he's, scre into, he's screaming. He he's turned into boss, nah, baby. He's screaming at me, uh, blind fight. I'm like, yeah, nice try. Uh, Creep. <laughs> all right. Uh, Christian, here yeah. it is. I'm, I'm going to go a little a, a little stranger here, too. I'm going with the older version of Ferris Bueller oh. for my boss. Um, I think Ferris Bueller as a boss would be awesome. I think that... So wait, you're Ferris Bueller, We don't. is there a movie this person's from? You're yes, aren't you saying... That you, that, yeah, I, but you have to pick questions. young Ferris Bueller. Fine, I'll take young Ferris okay, Bueller. Good. Fine. They're, they're, look, we're, we're in, the, we're in the, the era where you, you, can, get, you can have a 20-year-old boss. That's fine. Um, Ferris Bueller... Yeah, whatever he was, eighteen. He is, he is, he he is a dude. You know what a fun place to work, and it's not like the place is going to shut down anytime soon. That dude finds a way to keep getting deals done. It is going to be an incredible time. The company picnic party is going to be amazing. <laughs> Everything is going to be taking a baseball game. I mean, Ferris Bueller. In the middle of in the middle of it, he, you're going to wind up having uh, you know a song and dance could happen. The, the amount of people that he would bring in, and then you're just going to have Cameron sulking in the in the in the corner, but you know that something is you're gonna you can have Cameron there doing voices. You can pretend he's Rooney. It's gonna be there's gonna be so much fun at that office. I could I could love to have Ferris Bueller as my boss. De uh, oh, sorry, Perry Thanks. first, then Dennis. Yes. I am going with a completely out of left field choice, and I'm saying Pat Finley from Heavyweights. I love that character, and when I remind thought me. He he's like the heavy set counselor who oh, okay. who, who kind of comes together and he's their he's their favorite counselor in the Chipmunks and then he winds he winds up you know leading the charge in the Apache relay at the end and they okay. overtake Tony Perkins together and then he's the one put in charge of the camp so you clearly know from that character journey that he's meant to be a leader but when I read this question what I thought was what do I want in a boss. And all I want above all else in a boss is someone who is crazy passionate about whatever they're leading. And talk about a guy who cares about his campers and cares about upholding the, the legacy that Camp Hope established. And, and talk about having fun. I don't want to jump on the blob all day and have food fights, even though they're probably not allowed to have food fights anymore. But I want to work at Camp Hope, kind of. And I want Pat Finley to be my boss. 
Okay, Dennis. All right, I'm gonna pick a character who who played a boss in the movie Big, which was Robert Loggia as uh, Mr. McMillan for Mr. McMillan's uh, toy choice. company yeah. CEO. He's a great boss. All he does is he meets Tom Hanks, Josh's, uh, his character Josh, at, at F.A. Schwartz. He sees that he works with the company. He does a little chopsticks with him on the big piano. Suddenly he's promoted to the vice president of uh, <laughs> vice president of toy, uh, toy production or whatever. And all, all Josh has to do is play with toys all day and tell him what, what toys he likes and what he doesn't do. I like a boss like that yeah. where I, I get to do something I'm passionate about and have a lot of fun, get promoted. He's... Pa he's uh, He's right behind me. He's giving me a raise. I get, I get to, you know, get this nice huge apartment in, in New York City, and he, he supports me all the way. All right, now why are these people terrible bosses? Go ahead. Well, I mean, I, I'd hate to do this again with Perry though, too. But I got, I mean, I think that Robert. <laughs> you such a hard time. I know. I'm sorry. It's just a Robert Loja. When you hear that, I was like, I feel like Ferris Bueller and Robert Loja's character could start a company together. As we that camp closed down, the minute the movie was over. Go back because then they want to work for Pat, and they're they're lifetime campers. That's what happens. Pat, no, and then here's another thing: when you say Ferris Bueller, and we mentioned Lozier from Big, they go, "Oh yeah, I remember those guys." Pat, Andy had to. Andy was looking into his memory bank. Go, who the hell is Pat? Billy? You want a boss that people know who it is? I don't even well, remember. No, I want like, the right boss. Okay, you're right. You want to hear the right boss, but you also want to hear a name of a guy. Like when you walk in, you're like, "Oh, who do you work for? Coke? Who do you work for? Limp Blop Blop? That's who he is. He's Limp Blop Blop." Because if you've I was got. Ever you... Told I would work for Ferris Bueller, I would turn around and go the other way. No, I you would not. Oh, Okay, Come on, how much fun? If you work in our office, it's fun! Yeah. Working for Ferris Bueller might be, might be fun. I think Christian thinks he's Ferris Bueller. I'm not the boss over there. <laughs> it might be fine for a little while, but I'm someone who likes to actually get work done and and have like a great company and stuff I could be proud of. Abe Froman would make sausages. He, he would be late, he would screw things up, he would drive me nuts. I, I, I'm with Perry, like, uh, I like Ferris Bueller, he'd be a lot of fun. Exactly! I think, I think going Everyone to, loves I, Ferris Bueller! Yeah, I think, it'd be a lot of, I think it'd be a lot of fun to go to work. The problem is, if he was the boss, you wouldn't have a job in six months. Not he, true. He, he, yeah, he'd run the he'd run the company in the ground. He'd, he'd make horrible decisions and he everything. He makes great decisions. No, it'd be a lot of fun. Six months, he's done. Oh, I see. I disagree. He's a survivor. He's going to make sure that company that company will always keep going. That is a dude that he screams billionaire. You think he's he's sitting? He's your guy. I don't know what that guy's doing. I don't doing. necessarily he's working need down a the billionaire. Block, I need someone who's going to keep the company intact and be super passionate about what they're well, doing. Fine, he'll that's be, he'll be passionate. He can run. He can, he can run a subdivision of uh, you know the kickball well, camp at Ferris's place. I mean, I don't, the thing. Since I'm not familiar yet, why is he going to run that the right way? Oh, he's going to run it the right way because, okay, so I'm going to spoil the crap out of heavyweights. I'm sorry, oh, guys. It's okay. No. It's been out for a <laughs> He's a ghost. You should see heavyweights if you haven't. So when the movie starts, they have these super loving, wonderful he their owners of the camp. Then Tony Perkis comes in, and he's a douchebag, and he's really nasty. Ben Stiller, he's super right? Fit. That's Ben Stiller. Right. And he, like, ruins the camp. He basically sucks the life out of camp, starts making it exactly what you would think a fat camp would be. A miserable workout, and he's so nasty, and he's the most terrible guy in the world. And it isn't until Pat and the campers rise up and lead it and lead a charge together that they're able to take him down. So he was, the, he was like the head guy in charge of overthrowing this terrible, terrible person who was ruining what they love, and then he was given control of the camp. So there's no doubt in my mind that if we ever did, like, heavyweights X amount of years later, he'd still be in charge and it'd be wonderful. To be fair also too, because going to, and I'm gonna let I'm not gonna let Robert Loja off the hook here too. <laughs> Dennis is like, oh he's such a fun and great boss. That's because Tom Hanks was a fun dude and he saw he saw it in him, which is great. He hired some turds beforehand. I mean he, he had Ryan Ryan O'Neill was, was running that place into the ground. I mean the, the stuff that they were making was terrible. His decision making of who he was hiring for execs was awful. That place was like a funeral home before Josh got there. So he's not making great choices. He got lucky. He found one good dude. He found his LeBron James, and he went with it. But if you have, but Ferris Bueller's always making good choices. He knows who to surround himself. He got himself. He got himself. His friend Cameron. He got his personality. Cameron. He got Sloan to do certain things for him. I mean, even Rooney and Grace. That Grace likes. Even Grace knew that how great of a guy he was. The kids all love him because that's why you want a boss that everyone wants to work for because that creates productivity. That he's a creative dude. Ferris Bueller would run an amazing company. Sign me up. 
Ferris. I'm there. Ferris right, I'm Bueller using as your final thoughts. Two. Two. Go ahead, Fer- uh, Perry. Ferris Bueller would probably be, like, if he was ever at a successful company, he'd probably be, like, the number two. He'd be, like, the class clown of the office, just rah-rah and doing stupid stuff. Anything Ferris Bueller does is probably going to tank eventually. And you're Man. you're going to be the one who's kind of run over for it. Like, you have a nice car? Forget your nice car, because that's going out a window. And, <laughs> and <laughs> Pat, Pat, Pat is just the ultimate safe bet when you're talking about running a company. He is passionate, he is kind, he is level-headed. You know you are in the right boat if you're in any sort of company and he's at the helm of it. Okay, so for, for me, uh, yeah, uh, Ma- Mr. McMillan, he did hire some turds, right? But, <laughs> but he was Thank able you. to Thank he you. was able to override them when, when the time came. Right. When, when he believed in something, he believed in Josh, he believed in Tom Hanks' character, he was able to override them even as, as bad as they were. So he's still the CEO. The company's been around for a long time. It's not going anywhere. Stability, that that's the key. If I want a boss, I want stability. I want a, a nice, fun job I'm passionate about and lots of money. Ooh, all right, that was fun. Dan. Uh, yeah, just a couple things. Uh, Ferris Bueller is supposedly 18 years old in Ferris Bueller's day off. So a young so boss. He can legally run right. a business. He can legally run a business. That's what he did in one day. Yeah. And uh, Josh Baskin's job in big vice president in charge of production. That's yeah. the uh, promotion Whoa, that he nice. gets where he gets to play with the toys. Uh, yeah, factually, that's about it. Uh, a lot of I, I was just I, to be honest, I was just listening to a lot of that. I wasn't even reading. <laughs> that. Just curious to see what people said, but uh, yeah, I, I think uh, uh, there's a clear favorite on the Twitter poll, but I think it's gonna be a very t- difficult choice. Uh, on this round. Yeah, I think uh, for me, Dennis won. <laughs> that was, the, that was, that was the, probably the best choice. And then uh, Christian got a little bit on you, but still. You defended it fine. So it came down to then Ferris Bueller or Pat Von Lee. <laughs> Pat Von Lee. You need to Von watch Lee. heavyweights. Uh, but here's where the problem was. I didn't know who Pat Van Lee was, which was definitely didn't help. But I do know who Ferris Bueller is. So <laughs> when they knocked you down with all the points as to why he'd be a terrible boss, I had to agree with it. So Christian's out. I'm out. Oh. Christian's oh. out. Oh. Harry's in. Like they said, oh, man. shocker, oh, but I'm going there. Christian, wow. though, fantastic job. Wow. Uh, 54% of the Twitter audience would vote for Ferris Bueller. Uh, 30% for Mr. McMillan. 16% Pat Finley. Pat Finley. 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 Finley, not Finley. Okay, sorry. Pat Finley. Hey, he sounds like a nice guy who at least ran the camp nicely. Ferris Bueller's just going to break your car. Here we go. I only have one name left. Mr. Ken Napsack, come on up here. Let's do it, Ken. Ken Napsack. This ain't whiskey. It's chrome. If you had brought your own booze, I would have been impressed. Uh, I got to prove I can do this sober sometimes, Andy. It's good to be back here at the five. My favorite thing is the bathroom stalls with two inches between the doors <laughs> so you can talk to the person waiting for you. It's right. also like a nice line so that people can see you, you too. put down it's the only nice. belt Dan Merle doesn't own here. <laughs> Ooh. Wow. All right. Well, here we go. The last question is a blind fight, so it, it doesn't really matter what you pick. Uh, do I have it written down? There it is. We wrote it down in here. Blind fight. Here we go. Guys. What movie should be always playing in heaven's largest IMAX theater? (gasps) What movie should be playing in heaven's largest IMAX theater always? Dennis. All right. uh, I say It's a Wonderful Life. It's a classic Christmas movie that shows uh, a character who who faces, you know, doubt. He felt faces guilt, he faces the pressures of supporting his family, his community and everyone else and and through the eyes seeing how his life would be or in other, others lives would be without him. He learns the value of his own life, and uh, there's also, you know, a religious aspect in there with uh, Clarence the Angel, and uh, I think that's the movie that they should be playing. Perry, you're next. This is so easy for me. If I go to heaven and I gotta watch a movie in IMAX format, 
over and over and over for the rest the of my existence. the only one you can see for IMAX, yeah. Jurassic Park. <laughs> I feel like anybody could have guessed that I was going to say that. If I if I have to watch a movie, and It's a Wonderful Life is great, and I, I would envision that as, as an appropriate heaven movie, but if I have to watch something <laughs> over and over, I most certainly don't want to have those messages repeated in my mind and just see the value of family and what I'm missing. <laughs> Whereas I could sit back and relax and watch T-Rex, a uh, T-Rex and Perry Velociraptors. Hates families. <laughs> Perry hates families. <laughs> Dennis hates Carl. Yeah. Um, I could just watch that T-Rex rip people apart. Also, just the, the IMAX format thing kind of makes me think, what better movie to put in that format than Jurassic Park? It's one of those movies where all of the effects, all the visuals still hold up. You can watch it over and over. It never gets old. It's wonderful. Ken. Uh, you know, if you're going to have a movie playing over and over and over again and, and have an Andy, you're going to need to focus on one character, and that's Jesus. So I'm choosing the big Lebowski. <laughs> All right. All right. Look, I want to go to heaven. I think I'm going to heaven, but I'll tell you what, I don't think there's a lot to do in heaven. I think you're going to walk around a lot. On some, you're going to have some puppy dogs you had in the second grade. Then you'll get over that in a couple minutes. You're going to want to be entertained. You're going to want to sit down and have some fun. And that is where you want to watch one of the best comedies of all time. You could sit there with your friends, your grandfather you haven't seen since 1988, and you'll be quoting this movie. He won't know it at first. You're but your league, That's right. And he's going to sit down. And then, of course, you're going to be able to sit with Jesus Christ. I'm not being blessed. Blasphemous here, go with me, and you're gonna watch another iteration of Jesus on the screen. <laughs> Nobody fucks with the Jesus, and you're gonna be able to say that to Jesus, who's gonna laugh and have a good time. You're gonna and, and then there's no greater sport to to pass the time than bowling. So you'll pick up some tips. I'm sure they have a lane in heaven. It's like Lucky Strike, but with gold lanes. It's gonna be fun, it's gonna be great. Big Lebowski, it's an off-kilter choice, Dennis and Perry, but it is the choice. All right, guys. Why is Big Lebowski <laughs> Jurassic Park in Earth's Fair Life? Why which one should not be there forever in the IMAX? Well, you're not gonna have any ladies in your heaven. And I'll tell you that. Did you think I was anyways? <laughs> you're, you're having... <laughs> I teamed up is. for that one. So you're having the sausage party heaven. And then I just, I want to have fun when I go to heaven. Yeah, but and I'm I mean, not going to have fun you watching have fun. But, but if you're, over But if you're in heaven, and I don't think God and Jesus are going to approve of all this, this killing and maiming of all these <laughs> characters. Dennis, Dennis, that's because you stopped reading the Bible after the, the okay. Old Testament. In the New Testament, God is fun. He likes things. He's, well, come on, everyone's on board. Is, isn't the, the Jesus one, character in, in Big Lebowski, isn't he like a pedophile or something? He, he so, is. So you think, but is, what is more Christian so, than redemption? <laughs> <laughs> what is more Christian than redemption, Dennis? Yours, look, I love It's a Wonderful Life. I love it. It's more of an instructional manual when you get to the lobby and you check, you know, you check in at a hotel and it says, here's what you can do. That's what It's a Wonderful Life is up there in heaven. Well, well in my Jewish heaven, it's meant to be Jurassic Park. <laughs> Why would you want any other movie playing on repeat in IMAX, again, in IMAX? IMAX, Jurassic Park, still best suited for that format. Why would you want to watch any other movie than one of the best movies of all time? It is time? great. That is a great choice, Perry. You got stuff on the big screen. But have you, are you a fan of Kenny Rogers' The New Edition? You will be after you've seen that musical sequence on IMAX in heaven forever. <laughs> Just walked one, in to see what once, condition. Once That's enough, awesome. But thank no, you. no, no, absolutely. Yours is great. Dun, da, 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 uh, I'm sorry, you might not get into heaven with that song performance of the movie because it's going <laughs> to be so big. But I'll tell you, Yours is good. Yours is good. But you're heaven, and I don't. I don't know if the Jewish faith. No, it's eternal. It's eternal. It goes on forever. How many times mm -hmm. can you watch a dinosaur eat Wayne Knight? Oh, uh, all right. I, I How can many watch times? that quite a bit. That's I not can heaven. also watch that a T-Rex eat it off, Eat the lawyer off the toilet. That over is and Dennis over and, and I's again. personal hell watching Wayne Knight get eaten over and over again. Uh, again, one, one, that's a great sweet choice. That's what you should watch before you get into heaven, so you can convert and f and believe in angels. <laughs> Yours is a pre-heaven choice. Mine is heaven. Yours is, yeah, yours is alright. Mine's the IMAX choice. <laughs> Mine's also the repeat over and over choice. How many times do you watch Jurassic Park? I cannot even count. And how many times do you learn new things about it every time I you watch it? I learn new things all the time. What, and have you, what have you learned? You see little details all the time, and if you have you ever read the book, you know, it's a really cool way to watch Jurassic Park over and over. They don't have the book in heaven. It's yeah. only the movie on IMAX. Oh, well, still, <laughs> yeah. I'm happy to watch the movie in IMAX over yeah. and over. But, <laughs> absolutely. So, But I'm, what I'm saying is so you, there's little things you can pick up about the 600th time you're watching this. You're going to be like, oh, the T-Rex well, is okay, on. Okay, what do you what do you pick up the 600th References. Times? Do you know they reference my hometown and Big Lebowski? Did no, because I don't like I no, don't want to watch it Pismo over and over. Beach. <laughs> Pismo Beach, but on the third viewing, you'd get that. On the 700th viewing, you'd pick up something else. Like what? 
Uh, you'd pick up, you know, you'd pick up what the, the phrase, uh, you know, what really uh, means to be a nihilist. You'd pick up the fact that Amy Mann is a guest star in that movie, the great singer-songwriter, wife of Michael Penn, uh, former singer of Till Tuesday. She lost a toe. You want wow. a toe? I can get you a toe. Okay, Dennis, what are we going to learn on the 700th viewing of yours? Uh, I, I think, like, out of, out of mind, for my movie, it, it, it's more God and Jesus approved. It, it's a movie that's not going to be, not going to be thrown out. As soon as they, you know, as soon as the first violent act happens in Jurassic Park, they're throwing it out. The first, you know, curse or swear word that happens in, in, um... In the Big Lebowski, mm -hmm. it's gone. It's gone. It's not gonna get repeat viewings. They're gonna show it once. Actually, they're not even gonna show it once. They're gonna show it like uh, for like Look. first five, ten minutes, and then they're gonna throw it out. You might be right. Saint Peter might li might not like that, but Je Jesus has a sense of humor, and he's gonna have a good time. And the Big Lebowski uh, is about. Jeffrey Lebowski, Lebowski, who who is a hero, he is a wanderer, he is a man that we, he's a prophet here on Earth, here in Los Angeles, Los Angeles in 1991-92 era. That, you're going to learn a lot All from right, him. Perry, what are we getting on your 700 viewing? Uh, I'll tell you though, if if these two movies are getting thrown out in your heaven, I, I don't want to be there. Um, I mean, you know, that, if I didn't want to say the, thing, the blasphemy stuff here. The, but. Thing, the thing you're getting on the 700th viewing of Jurassic Park is the same amount of fun and excitement and intention and uh, attention you got on the first viewing. If you're going to watch something over and over, you need it to be rewatchable and to be exciting every single time over. And even though you might get that from The Big Lebowski, you're not having very many other people, as much as Jurassic Park, at least, yeah. joining you in your heaven. Then also, but, just the I, I'll come back to the IMAX thing. One final point: not a lot of people in heaven are going to enjoy Jurassic Park because not a lot of them believe in dinosaurs. <laughs> 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 All right, Dan. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, Ken had one small misstep. It's uh, Kenny Rogers one? and yeah. Well, factual misstep. Uh, Kenny Rogers in the first edition, not new edition. Uh, but I, thank you, Dan. Um, uh, Twitter had a lot of things to say, but it really is summed up by Dan Brown at Dan Brown VT. He said, "Ken's answer was too good. I need him to be breathalyzed." Uh, <laughs> Uh, many of the variations there are people speculating on Ken's sobriety given the quality and <laughs> What's the, in the, mug? the timber of his answer. Um, I do. We do have the Twitter poll, which is uh, uh, well, yeah. It's, we have a, a clear leader in the Twitter poll. We'll see what they say. But um, yeah, not much facts that I can bring to this with my earthly judgment. Well, so I think, I'll leave it to yours, Andy. Uh, I, look, I gotta, I gotta give Ken the win on that. I think Ken really just had some mic drops in that. So Ken, you're safe. It came down between Perry and Dennis. And uh, Perry got the other mic drop for me, which was, I don't want to see my family and what I'm missing. <laughs> for no forget in heaven. It may be God and Jesus approved, but I got to go Jurassic Park. So Dennis, Ooh. kudos though, you made it very far. And thank you for coming. You must come back. No, thanks for having me. I'll yes. be back. So that means... Ken, wow, oh, no. you swoop in at the end for oh, the last, boy. and Perry, you oh, made it all yeah, the way. This is crazy. Yeah. How about a round of applause for these two? First pick, first pick. Wow. All right, you guys ready to do this? This is the blind, oh. uh, this is the uh, speed round. Yeah. Speed round, and now we can activate all of our past players. Oh, right. You guys, well, do we have a mic? We don't we have, have a mic. We have a microphone that could be passed. I'm going to come to you guys to see who, uh, Oh my you God. can't make the final call, but you're going to help uh, sway if you want on who makes the best decisions here, okay? Best arguments here. So here we go. This is how this works. You have not done this before, so Ken has. You're going to have 20 seconds, and then you'll have 10-second rebuttals. Okay. If you both say the same answer at the same time, it's whoever said it first. And time will begin when you begin speaking, which I'll remind you as we keep going. All right? Any, any immediate questions? I'll is clear it best of five? Best of yes, five, five additional points here. Gotcha, gotcha. So five points. You guys don't have any points. Gotcha. We're, we're back to zero, and now you are collecting the points. Best of five. Here we go. Question number one. What superhero movie, or what superhero, should Aaron Sorkin adapt into a film? <laughs> Man. <laughs> it may be an existing one. All right, I'll say Batman. I will say, um, I will say, I will, uh, classics, Superman. Super yeah. Batman versus Superman, Superman. again. <laughs> yep. But now it's Aaron Sorkin writing it. 
Perry, your first time begins when you speak. You'll have 20 seconds, and you'll hear the ding over there when the time's up. Well, after BVS, which I didn't hate, but I didn't love, all I really want is a Batman movie that's about a character, and I can see him talking and emoting and understand who he is, and who better to write a dialogue-driven Batman movie, which would be super different than any other superhero movie out there, but Aaron Sorkin. He would do an incredible job with it, and... I just want to see that version because it's refreshing. That's great. You're absolutely right. Aaron Sorkin would do, take a, a new level to Batman, and that's what I'm looking for, new levels. What does Aaron Sorkin do? He pulls back the curtain on the White House. He pull, pulls back the curtain on Sports Center. He pulls back the curtain on Facebook. He takes something that we we look up and go, oh, that's great, that's perfect, Superman. And he's going to pull back the curtain and show the inner workings. You don't need a walk and talk. You need a fly and chat. And that's what Aaron Sorkin's going to give you in my Superman movie. I don't movie. think Aaron Sorkin would ever be able to do a fly and chat. He'll have Superman walking down a hall, and that's going to be the worst version version of Superman, whereas Batman can scheme, and he goes down into the Batcave, and you want to see him think, and... Um, yeah, uh, you know, Batman's going to be walking and ch chatting with himself. Superman's going to have Lois Lane around. He's going to have uh, people that Daily Planet. You, you, you want to see a Clark Kent walk and talk? That's going to be great. All right, that's it. Time's up. Good fight. These are the worst ideas ever. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's here. Anybody over there want to chime in? Thoughts on what you heard there? Yeah, I wouldn't see either of these movies. <laughs> Uh, as far as opinion on who won or just in Based general. on the arguments, yes. What did you guys think? I got to tell you, between the two of those, I'd like to counteract the parry at the end there because I, I, I think that the fact of being in the cave, I think, uh, yeah, you would see a more cerebral Batman. Yeah, I'd go with uh, with Perry. I think when she mentioned the scheming part, I think Aaron Sorkin can yeah. easily can do that. Yeah, I got to go with Perry here. She won me over with her Batman analogy. Her Batcave analogy. All right, I heard enough. John and Mark, you'll start the next one. All right, I, got, I agree. That's where I was. my head was at, too. Uh, the worst version is Superman walking through hallway. That did stay with me. Uh, and you queued her up there with the flying chat, because that would be very strange. So, Perry, you get the first point. Oh, Good God. job, Perry. Good job, Perry. Get her on. Get her on. All right, number two. What is the best movie featuring Russell Crowe? Gladiator. <laughs> oh dear God! Well, I, I've seen so many competitors do this, and they draw blanks. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, a beautiful mind. Okay, he said that right. He was. <laughs> okay. <You're safe>. okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if only it were Brad Pitt. <laughs> Hey, it might not be over yet, Dan. Uh, Gladiator and uh, Beautiful Mind. Perry, you're first. Gladiator is a movie that launched his career. It is the ultimate character journey. It's the ultimate character epic. And he plays that role in a way that nobody else could have done it like him. Like, he commands the screen. He was made to play Maximus. He's incredible at it. And he's still, to this day, even though he has a lot of other great performances, he's still known for Gladiator. When you think Russell Crowe, you think Gladiator. He crushed that. He is absolutely still known as Gladiator because that established him as this big, beefy, epic leading man, which is why A Beautiful Mind took him to a different part of his career, took him to a different kind of performance. A little more quieter, a little more deeper, a little more, you know, crazy at times. It took, it was a character study uh, different than what he's known for now. I think he is still compared to the Gladiator and a lot of people, when they saw A Beautiful Mind... You do have a quieter movie in A Beautiful Mind, but the cool thing about Gladiator is you have a big action epic and you also have those quieter character moments, so you get the best of both worlds and you get to see Russell Crowe have so much range. What A Beautiful Beautiful Mind did is it proved that that Russell Crowe could tell a story with needing not needing you know his sleeves cut off. It was it was something and, and that, that I, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> oh is that God. it? They both have the time, right? Yes. yes. Uh, wow, that was weird. I was with Ken actually for a little bit, but then yeah, he, he, he did stay there at the end. But yeah, uh, let's go, Mark or John in the front. What do you guys think? Uh, yeah, Ken. When you lost it at the end there, I, I was with you for a while, but uh, Perry had a little bit stronger argument with Gladiator. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, you guys are both wrong. It's uh, L.A. Confidential. What's up, son? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But based on those arguments. Based on those arguments, I would have to go with uh, Gladiator. All right. Yes, I got to agree. You, I was with you, though, and then you, you lost your, your train. So uh, sadly, uh, you get, don't look at that. But fortunately for Perry, she does. You need, he needs to get this. Yeah, I'm on the road. Ken right. needs to win all of their remaining yeah. points. Oh, he needs to have the comeback. Oh, yeah. All right. Go on, Ken. Here we go. What animated character would make the best imaginary friend? Wally. Oh, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> this is 
where I've never seen an animated film in my life. Come on! All right, uh, I'm gonna go with Fievel from uh, uh, America as well. America Tale. Is that one from your childhood? That's one from my childhood. <laughs> Somewhere out there. Okay, we got Wally versus Fievel. I loved Fievel. Yeah, uh, what's wrong with Fievel? No, it's not that old. It's a deep cut. Yeah. Uh, but I love it. All right. Uh, Wally, whenever you're ready, Perry. I absolutely adore Wally. I love that character. I love Wally's entire movie. And if I have an imaginary friend that I got with me, I don't want to be talking to that imaginary friend. I want Wally just to roll around with me. And Wally can read people. He watches movies. He knows. And he has his pet cockroach, Hank. So I'd get two friends out of it because he carries them around. So now I have two great pets. I never want a friend that's a person. Let's be honest, Perry. Let's, <laughs> let's be really honest here. Let's, All right. Let's give him a fair time. Here we go. <laughs> Fair, fair, reset the time, go ahead, reset. Let's be honest, Perry. Wally's a bit slow. Do you want to spend the rest of your time with this imaginary friend who's like, trash, bug, what, Perry. Like, that's going to get annoying after a while. Oh Fievel is loyal and dedicated. You, your parents move to another state. He's going to follow you. He's going to sing to the sky. So, where, or whatever the song is. Um, he's gonna sing. I, I don't want a human friend. I want one that's puppy or kitten-like, and that's what Wally is. And he's amazing, and he moves fast. You see all that trash he collects all by himself when all the other units are gone. He's just stacking it up real quick. He can keep up with you. You're gonna want a friend that, that's gonna teach you some really deep things about the, your history, your country. He's gonna be there. He's gonna sing songs. Wally's gonna pick up trash and get go spin around in circles. Trash is fun. Like, <laughs> <laughs> All right, out of time. Fifel is a mouse. Fifel. Fifel is a mouse. Five, five, five person. Fifel. 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 They say it in Russian. Polish? Russian? Anyway. Christian, you have the mic. What, what do you think based on the arguments? Uh, I got Ken on that one. I think he's right. I think that trash can would get annoying after a while. <laughs> I mean, I, I just like that Perry said I don't want human friends, so I'm going to go with Perry on that one. Hey, I'm going to go with Ken as well. I, he makes a good point that, like, uh, Wally is going to get annoying after a while, and especially you can't communicate with him at all. Yeah, I agree. I guess when you have uh, Wally as a friend, your surrounding would be extremely clean, but that's about the only benefit. Front row, yeah, Mark or Schnapp? Yeah. Uh, Go. Uh, I think Ken. I think Ken nailed it with the loyalty with Fievel. Yeah. I don't know. I think you get a two for one with Wally and his little cockroach friend. So I'm going with Wally. See, that felt like a cheat. It was one. And so yeah. Uh, he carries him in his belly. Yeah, though. he does. He carries around. Uh, I, I, yeah, it is a slight edge, uh, and also just because you didn't know it was a mouse, uh, I gave a slight edge to Ken. So you're still in this, Ken. Yeah. yeah. Saw that movie. Two to one. Saw the movie in the theater. <laughs> Me too. I remember it. What is the song? Somewhere. Somewhere out there. Somewhere out there. Out there. Out there. Out, no, that's Home Alone. Home Alone, no, right. Yes. What is the song? Somewhere out there. Out there. That's Where love be the just, truth. There you go. Now we have to pay the rights. We're going to pay for the rights. <laughs> oh, such a sad song. Uh, okay. Here we go. Best Star Wars character oh. who doesn't appear in the original trilogy of, of films. Mace Windu. Do I get a minute to think? No. You have like 10 seconds. <sighs> Damn it, I'm screwed. Um, BB-8. That All right. technically counts, yeah. Yeah, BB-8 yeah. versus Mace Windu. Ken, you're up first this time because you spoke first. I have no idea why I didn't pick Ray, but here we go. Mace Windu was the best Jedi of all time, and, and he brought something different. Sam Jackson begged to be in the movie, and they rewarded him. He chose a purple lightsaber that established an entire new canon. But here's what's the best about Mace Windu. He saw everything coming. He predicted it. Go back to The Phantom Menace. I've seen that movie many times. He predicted everything that would happen. He was right. It cost him his life. He's an intriguing, deep character. He is not. Not the best Jedi, first of all, but I have to go with BB-8 because one of the biggest accomplishments of Force of, of the Force Awakens is that they introduced a new droid that lives up to C-3PO and R2-D2 standards. He's incredible. He's pertinent to the story. He's not just a cute addition, even though he's super cute too. And I'm gonna love seeing him in future movies to come. He has the ability to go the length and turn. I love BB-8. I loved him the first time around when he was called R2-D2, and I loved him the better version. It was called K2SO. Droids are always going to be there. You, Mace Windu, I'm talking about in canon, is one of the most important figures. But not as presented in the movie. BB-8 is pivotal to Force Awakens. Nothing in Force Awakens could happen similar to R2 and C-3PO unless BB-8 was there. Woo! Whoa. That's Whoa. how you do it. Based Whoa. on those arguments, panel, what do you guys think? Oh, that's tight. <sighs> 
That's much tight. tighter. I, uh, I'm giving a slight, very slight edge to Ken because I think uh, Mace Windu did bring a lot to the prequels and uh, knowing what to expect with the prophecy. I'm not gonna go on my personal opinion on this one because I'm gonna go for what I heard right now. I thought Ken was gonna have it right off the bat, but Perry made some great arguments on BB-8. I happen to think Mace Windu is the better, but I think Perry's arguments were, were much better. I think for me it was very close, but because I actually was more on Perry's side beforehand, but Ken made a stronger argument, I go with Ken. Wow. Whew. I thought it was a really close argument as well, but I gotta uh, give the edge to Perry here. I think she made a really good point about BBA's a pivotal, uh, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but he was important for The Force Awakens. I gotta go, because uh, BB-8 didn't go out like a bitch, so. <laughs> <laughs> nice show. Josh, uh, did you chime in, Josh? Yeah, uh, real quick, I'm going with BB-8. He's adorable, Mace Windows a douche. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, did you want to say anything? Uh, I, I actually would have. Uh, I'll, I'll double. Like, you don't need. Uh, you don't I actually need. would have gone. I think with with Ken. I agree. It was a great back and forth. But I think Ken hit her back a little bit more on uh, the drawbacks of BBA than she hit him back necessarily on the drawbacks of Mace Windu. So I would go with Ken actually. It's on the fence, and because it's so close, I'm going to give a slight edge to Ken just so we can really make this a proper tiebreaker. Okay. Oh, oh boy. I mean, oh, here boy. we go. Let's really I, earn this, guys. All right. Good Ready? Run. Yeah. This was, this is a, uh, this is, this is, oh, uh, okay, let's do this one. This is tougher, All right, Ken? Good luck. Yeah, it uh -oh. is. <laughs> Best comedy that never had a prequel or sequel. Billy Madison. Bridesmaids. Wow. wow, all right, you guys wow. got those out quick. And those both count. Bridesmaids. Bridesmaids. Billy Madison, Billy Madison Bridesmaids. Billy Madison versus Bridesmaids. No current prequels or sequels for those either Those are both safe. All right, this is it for all the marbles. Uh, Billy Madison was first, 20 seconds. Go ahead, when you're ready. The greatest thing about Billy Madison is that there was nothing like it at the time. It completely coined a new style of comedy, and it launched Adam Sandler's career, for better or worse. But Billy Madison is absolutely hilarious. There's very little like it beyond Adam Sandler's follow-up movies. And it's heartfelt. It's got actual meanings and messages, and it's a really great movie. I, that's another one I can watch over and over. For better or worse? Worse. All right. Adam Sandler. I'm not here to make, I don't make fun of that guy. He's got a good career. But but Bridesmaids brought a, to the forefront this female comedy, much needed female comedy genre. The script was Oscar nominated, launched Melissa McCarthy into the stratosphere for Gilmore Girls now, and she's a leading lady. Uh, Kristen Wiig's amazing. Some memorable comedy Melissa scenes. McCarthy, for better or worse. But when I'm talking about a great comedy that also has an epic legacy, mm -hmm. it's Billy Madison. I don't think Bridesmaids is going to have the legs quite like that movie does, because it's still to this day nothing like it. Billy Madison, is that the one is that, that, that's not Happy Gilmore? It's not the wedding singer? What, they're all running together for me now all these years later. I can't quite remember, but you know what? I remember Bridesmaids. I remember where I was. Good. How about a round of applause to both fighters? That's how you do it. Woo! All right. Let's go around the horn real quick. Thoughts based on the arguments. Uh, I mean, I argued Happy Gilmore up top, and based on the arguments, Perry knocking that out of the park. Perry number up. Sorry, Ken, I've gone against you every single time, so this time I've got to go with Perry. Uh, I, I think, I, yeah, I think the argument was just stronger. Uh, it was close for me. They both made great arguments. I'd slightly give the edge to Ken. He mentioned the, the Oscar-nominated script. I'm also gonna give the edge to Ken. I loved what this comedy did for female characters. Yeah, I'm not gonna watch any of these bastard Netflix uh, shows that uh, Adam Sandler's doing, so. <laughs> So bridesmaids? <laughs> so that's no on Billy Madison. Okay. Uh, I, I think Perry's arguments were, were were a little bit stronger. I think she what stuck with me was it defined a new style of comedy, which which I take is also launching Adam Sandler as we know it. So that. you all tied, Dan. Yeah, I think that I think that Perry had it until Ken in his waning seconds said, "Which one is it? Happy Gilmore? What?" They all run together, and I think that was a really good point because even me going back, I'm like. I do have to sometimes stop and think too, uh, so I think that was a really good counterpoint. So I think Ken snuck in with a with a killer blow right at the end there, but it's close. It's really close. Uh, thank you for all the thoughts. I'm gonna make the final call. It's so close that I think you both should be feel very good about this. You both win in my book, but based on the arguments, I do think the slight edge for me was based on a lot of things that were already repeated. Was to Ken. Ooh. 
Ken, you did pull it off. I think you did put the Oscar winning me the women of film, but then also the you did remind when you when you pulled that out of which one is it? I was I was edging with her, but then you did take me around. I go, it's kind of true. I don't remember now which ones are which. Uh, Ken Napsock wins. Oh, wow. Can we get Perry first name out of the hat? Oh man, yeah. yeah. Perry. That's I think yeah. Technically, yeah. Perry really should win. But I got it based on the arguments. Uh, Perry, wow. Billy Madison, Happy Gilmore, and the wedding singer of all movies. You guys got to rewatch those. <laughs> those are the best. Uh, yeah, to, to, for, for a lot of people. <laughs> uh, it was really close, though. But a uh, round of applause again. Perry, wow. From the top, you made it to the end. That's a win in my book. And I hope you will come back because yeah, you should come do this again and, and, and see where you can uh, where you can go on your own. Uh, wow, that was fantastic. Ken, great to have you. Good to be back. That was so fun. Good to and be let's sober. Think, you did sober. You won an episode. You know, she really won because she won more rounds than you technically. She's the MVP. It's about even. Uh, let's go over to the, everyone think on the couch. Josh McCuga, thank Who's got the mic? Yeah, me. Josh McCuga will go around. Any, I mean, we're all plugging all this collider and everything, but anything else sure. you guys want to send out? Josh McCuga, Josh McCuga on Twitter. Yeah, Instagram, uh, the Josh McCuga Show on YouTube, Collider TV Talk every Monday. Christian Harloff. Yeah, just check out uh, Collider Video. You can catch the Movie Trivia Schmodown and uh, Collider Jedi Council, Movie Talk, everything we have going on over there. Please check that out. Dennis. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at TheCaro, Instagram Dennis.TZNG, and then also Collider on YouTube. Wendy Lee. Uh, Monday through Friday on Collider Movie Talk and on YouTube, the Movie Couple channel, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Wendy Lee Zaney. John Schnepp. Buy my goddamn fucking comic book. <laughs> Slayer number two comes out April 5th. <laughs> All right. Mark Riley. Hey, follow that up. At Riley around on Twitter and Instagram. And also, Collider Nightmares are coming back once a month. Stay tuned for that. Collider video, of course. And, of course, Schmoes No main show live every Wednesday, 7 o'clock. Dan Merle over there at Merle Dan's and I'm there quickly. Yeah, yes. At Merle Dan. And, uh, well, no. Yeah, come see us at WonderCon. On yes. Saturday. Saturday. If you're watching this Saturday, Saturday morning, morning, come see us come at WonderCon. Come see you too. Yes, yes, exactly. You guys Sorry, are there yeah, Sunday? Yeah, we have a WonderCon uh, Schmodown panel on Sunday. So if you're there, yeah, on, all weekend uh, Sunday, long. Sunday. Anaheim, just drop by. Perry Nemiroff. Uh, Perry, uh, your Twitter is. My uh, Perry, Twitter yeah, is. Uh, Perry, uh, P. Uh, Nemiroff. Uh, P. Right. Nemiroff, yep, Twitter and Instagram. Uh, congratulations, Thank really. You. I was rooting. Thank I, you. I almost just gave it to you just to give it to you, but I, I can't do it that way. You really blew me away. That was very impressive. Ken Napsack and Ken Napsack. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, not only uh, that's uh, we currently sober is, is true. Uh, we are at the currently. WonderCon panel. We're gonna, uh, we're gonna be also at the Star Wars celebration. We got a big uh, trivia battle with Sam Witwer, John Campy, and me. So if you're in Orlando for that, check it oh, out. Oh, that's gonna be good. We're gonna be yeah. down there too. Let's all party. Let's do it. Celebration. Oh. Screen Junkies Collider. We're all there. I love it. Uh, that's it. We. Uh, I don't know if we have time. Do we have. We, uh, we have time. Well, yes. Yeah, so we'll try really quickly. But thank you for watching. We will be here next week. That's March Mania. That was crazy. Uh, and uh, thanks for doing it uh, for all you guys for coming and thank you for watching at home we love you have a great weekend bye bye everybody